<laughs> Danny Kibbles is a heater here. <laughs> Until the room warmed up. Um, Connell said that he would spend a few hours every day under Stills guidance, he and the other students in a small class, 30 classes in the Kirk's class. There were no more than seven or eight students in the first few years. But they were under his Stills tutelage for a few hours every day for the first nine months of their training. And what was that tutelage? He would take their hands day after day in his own hands on the model, or on occasion, patient agrees with the model, and guide them, first and foremost, in diagnosis, how to determine, how to detect what is under your hands, what is normal, firstly, and what is not normal. So don't miss, firstly, the opportunity of a perfectly healthy individual who has a minor complaint uh, as an opportunity to determine what is a relatively normal state of connective tissue and particular function. It's invaluable. The more normal normal is inverted commas compared to very sick or very injured patients. It is so, so bad. But the normal is enormous in its variety. The ectomorph individual compared to the endomorph is very different in its normality. The elasticity of the tissues is so different from the ectomorph compared to the endomorph. With the mesomorph, of course, some, some, something will one on the other. And again, you can only develop this with a lot of years of handling normal, relatively normal individuals. Because one of the biggest mistakes I used to make was not registering the fact that this individual's normal is very different from another's. And what I thought was abnormal, because it was hyperflexible perhaps, or insufficiently endable, was in fact perfectly normal for that individual. So you're using the leg as a lever to articulate perhaps the sacroiliac in an ectomorph, a dancer or a ballerina, or an ordinary individual who's never been a gymnast but is born very flexible. And your range of movement is so enormous before you need the resistance that they can be in great pain because of overuse. But then you compare the next patient who comes in, who's a stocky individual, an endomorph, and your range is tiny. And if you try to do more than what is a small range of motion, that will hurt the endomorph, the stocky individual, will be straining and missing points of resistance that are causing a particular problem in that individual. We must be ready for enormous variety and variation of the normal or near normal. So, the other thing that still insisted on when teaching, and when I read this, it's the fourth or fifth time I read this article from the time I read the case. I read it again about a year and a half ago. It really hit me. And it was concentration, concentration, concentration. Every second and minute that you are with a patient, not least when you're actually touching the patient, you have to concentrate. It's not easy, it takes quite a while. If you've got worries and concerns in life, it's not easy. But at that moment in time, you have to be with all your concentration on what you're doing, and why you're doing it, what you're looking for, what's the next step that you want to do, and what's the reaction of the patient as you're doing what you're doing. You've got to keep your eyes on the face of the patient all the time, by the way. Concentration, concentration. So when I read that again about a year and a half ago, I said, do I really concentrate? And of course, we can all improve our concentration because of course I get distracted and I think and I'm bored, maybe and I'm tired, whatever. So I said, right, I'm going to try that much harder to concentrate. And why? What a difference it makes. What a difference when we really consciously decide to concentrate. And of course, you don't do it all the time because you're human. But you come back to it, it's confusing how to concentrate. 
promising the work becomes so much more interesting. But it means concentrating on your own body as well, and <coughs> avoiding strain, and avoiding getting too tense, and relaxing between every move so that you can remain sensitive at the same time. But concentrating as best you can. And one other thing that still insists on emphasizes the time there. The more you can see the anatomy of your hands, truly see the anatomy, layer on the layer, visualize the anatomy as you work, whether it's stretching an erector spinal muscle, working on the rotator cuff, insertions of the shoulder, you can actually see a little bit at the beginning, and more as you go back to the anatomy books. Again, what a difference it makes. How alive the work becomes as you handle anything becomes so much more interesting. Oh, not a sprained ankle. No, it's a fascinating part of the body. If you remember the, the intricate anatomy of that there. And if you start to think of the anatomical connections, the muscular chains, then you are really getting quite far into an exciting stage. Yes, you'll do exactly what Little John said you have to do. If you treat the neck, you should do so in a way that will be influencing at the other end of the body, pelvis, arches, feet, backs, because the possible changes that you're able to introduce. And vice versa, if you're treating the feet, you treat them in a way that should be more pelvis, if you have the neck in mind as well. We are blessed. We are actually blessed by having a background in body mechanics, in a visualization that for very many is impossible to see the uh, tensegrity principles of the body long before we came up for tensegrity and the interrelationship with myofascial structures. So, again, in many cases, we can hardly handle the neck. In many cases when you can hardly touch the pelvis because there is such a acute distress, or the ankle, or the knee. There may be two, three, four treatments I will not touch the knee or the ankle that's been injured because it's too painful anyway. But how do I have the conscience to take their money and do so enthusiastically? Not enthusiastically take their money, but how do I enthusiastically <laughs> nevertheless treat them? Treating everything else other than the knee or the elbow that they come in so desperately wanting help with. Because I believe in the mechanics. And the day I really believed in the mechanics was when a patient um, arrived with a severe knee problem, and I was treating the neck. It's bloody painful what you're doing in my knee or my hip. And then it reoccurred about two or three months later with another patient. I think vice versa, I was articulating the sacred neck. She said, my neck, you're hurting my it's hurting my neck. Now we all know this phenomenon when we apply traction to the head and neck and you set off an L5 S1 discopathy that's present at the same time. A ligament is sprain that's going on. And that's, that's obvious, that's, that's uh, the neural sheath that you're, you're pulling in. That's, that's anyone can do that physically. Um, here we're talking about the subtlety, just a quiet articulation of the sacred neck. And someone's telling me that their neck is killing them. That's like, really painful. And vice versa, and they're treating the neck. And they say, it's really catching at the bottom here, or in my knee, or in my hip. Then you believe. Then you believe everything else up to that point of view. Nice theory, hope. Maybe it is true, maybe it isn't true. And if you feel it on yourself, it's even more convincing. I felt it on myself after I was being treated for many months. I go off the table one day, having had a new injury, and go off the table. I began to walk away from the college clinic and I suddenly felt I was walking on two even legs. What it felt like to have two even, evenly balanced legs. It was a strange
refrained from it. The pleasant one didn't last for more than 10, 15 minutes. You know, the body gets used to the phenomenon that is supposed to be born and adapts and you forget about it. Like you forget about the pain that you may have had a week ago or a month ago. It's gone. You don't know the pain. But again, very interesting personal experience. Um, so, concentration, and as much as you can, see the anatomy on your fingers. But time again, be aware that that individual's normal at the age of 70, after years of degenerative changes, after years of postural adaptation to habits from early childhood, may limit your ability to achieve some ideal. This is a great danger. As young graduates, we think of ideals, we think of the best possible, the perfect. It just doesn't exist clinically, and it can't exist. We're all abnormal, in greater or less degree. Basically, our job is to help the body adapt, to adjust itself to itself and to, to your, your environment the best you can. And you'll get that 70 or 80 or 90 year old back on his or her feet to return to being somewhat independent and pain free with the most distorted spine imaginable. Because there are changes that have gone on, degenerative changes that you can never change. And they begin already at the age of 30 or 40. Certainly in the neck, I think, is 30 or 40. There are significant changes in many individuals. If you remember it, if you see the x-rays, if you see the studies, the lectures on that subject of um, anatomical abnormality, how percentage-wise, how common it is, if you, if you can recognize the fact that most individuals have all sorts of abnormal morphological changes, you're that much more careful not to insist moving apart because it has to move to a degree that you think is normal. You have to always try to judge what is their normal, that individual normal. Which is why one of the most important things that happened to me when I started hospital practice and had to treat very infirm individuals and very sick individuals sometimes was that I could not insist without hurting them or making them very ill. The moment I went beyond pain barriers, the moment I caused them discomfort or pain, things went disastrously wrong sometimes. I had to learn that hard way and bad. The moment someone is really injured or really sick, you're in another world. You have to come back to the principles of trying to help that body's capacity to adapt to the changes that have happened in their life. To overcome a sick of course, is an acute stage, and that's the first priority. Whether it's pain or illness, to try to get them over the acute stage as quickly as possible, without the danger as quickly as possible, without the great pain. The second stage is up to the patient. Are they willing to stay with you once the major symptoms are reduced? But the second stage of the practice, which is to write, try to sustain the medicine, you have so many methods, medications, injections, that can get you over an acute stage and hide the symptoms. But to sustain any improvement is very difficult. That's the real hard work we have. Try to stabilize the condition that you've helped improve. Quite a good percentage will stay so happy to be over the acute stage, or give you the benefit of the doubt, even though they've got no major symptoms, to continue coming to you for a while. Now there's the third stage, <coughs> for those who want it, that's the preventative stage. You may be seeing a patient only once a month, or once every three months, or once every five months, but there are patients that definitely need to be seen. Like you go to a dental hygienist, for four, five, six months. Because the wear and tear of life and stress has its effect, and we know the difference. If they can have a treatment once.
once in a while, but they'll continue to remain uh, higher. 